This is a movie, and this is real life. This dark history of South Korea was something that not a lot of people knew about, and the forgotten story just resurfaced recently in the last few years. Did you know that a concentration camp like called the South Korea's Holocaust or the real life squid games like area actually existed. And this is hopefully the last known dark camps, at least in South Korea. The story only became public and the public was outraged because of these famous documentaries, Kokomu, Kugoshi Algo Shipta, and took on the story to find victims who never talked about this for over like 25 years. It will shock you of how these places that you seem like you hear from like World War II days in Auschwitz happened also in South Korea. And of course, to make these videos and take my full time researching these cases and to present it to you guys, I have I haven't shaved in a hot minute. Oh God. <laughs> to make these videos possible, I really want to say thank you to today's partner, Harry's. And yes, I'm looking hairy today. Harry Shaver is the only shaver that I use because it is so affordable yet high quality. And let me just show you guys my shaving routine. What? These premium German engineered shavers does not compare to those cheap ones that you get and you just throw it out. It goes really close to the hair root so that you have a clean shave. I use this everywhere, arms, armpits, legs, including bikini line. And I can't do my bikini line without this. The grip especially is really nice and it's made from 50% recycled plastic. The foaming shave gel is also great for sensitive skin. It includes alloy and hyaluronic acid that your skin will love. You see how clean and smooth my skin is now? On top of that, the trial set is literally $3. Yes, $3. They have not raised the prices like WTF. You get a five blade razor weighted handle, a blade cover, and the foaming shave gel all for $3, bruh. So get your trial set for just $3 using the link right here. And just by clicking on the partners of the videos, you guys are supporting me and my channel as well. So thank you so much. This is a little 12 year old named Chung back in 1982. He was just a kid, so bright, super smart in school. During tests, he would always get first or at least second place, a very good listener, and even took care of his sick mother by making food for her. Something that might have been such a big task for a 12 year old. But he did it anyways because he was the son of the family and the son was all that this family had. But one day in 1982, it was getting Getting late and Chung never returned home. Come to find out, Chung ended up going to the nearby city with a neighborhood ajashi. Of course, being like 12 and you're going to the city, you were fascinated by a lot of things. There's a lot of things to watch, to eat. He was at the arcade room and it was such a great day for him until the neighborhood man just left him alone for a second when two policemen approached him and asked him, why are you here? Are you alone? The policeman told him, come with us to the police office. We're going to take you home. And of course, being 12 years old, naive, and thinking that these are policemen, obviously I could trust them, he ended up following them to the station. Little did he know that this would change his life forever. From then on, time to time, children would just go missing, vanished without a trace. This is Miss Lee, and in 1983, she was just seven years old. Her little brother and herself were out and again the police would approach them and they just followed after being in the police station for a couple of hours they told them that they would take them home and as soon as they left the station there was a white van waiting for them i mean legit starting from the van it really reminded me of the movie because in the movie you know you had these secret vans that would just take people and they would vanish without a trace these kids were then forced into the dark van with no explanation and they realized they weren't alone there were many other kids and adults and people just mixed shoved into this tiny van when they got to this unknown locations from here, this is when hell started. Of course, if not all, like a lot of the kids were screaming and crying and, and telling them like, where am I? I want to go home. But the minute you would cry, question, or complain, the guards would viciously start beating these kids up. When they entered this mysterious building, the victims claimed that it really looked like a prison cell. There was heavy steel doors that only locked from the outside, and inside of these long rooms were rows and rows of 
bunk beds. It was enough to fit at least from 80 to 100 people. Like, again, do you see like a little bit of the coincidences? Even more shockingly, they noticed that everybody was wearing the same uniforms. And the uniform color was blue with stripes on it. They were also forced to shave all their heads. Nobody can have long hair. And they were strips of their name and their identity. Now they were being called by numbers. They had to respond to the command officers as if they were in the military and there were also divisions like in the military. One woman who was only seven at the time when she was taken away even remembers that there were kids and babies younger than her. After changing their clothes, they went to bed for the night. Of course, I'm sure like nobody could probably sleep that day. And at 5 a.m. sharp, the alarms started to ring. Everyone started to walk outside. Of course, John and these kids who arrived like they weren't told anything to what to do and they just had to follow what everybody else was doing those people that were there before they arrived when they went outside those new kids new people that arrived were so shocked because it wasn't just them here it was literally thousands and thousands of people with the same uniforms just standing outside and they had to form like a specific line they realized it wasn't just kids, but a mix of adults, including elders. And these are some real photos of how these camps look like. I mean, it's legit straight out of a horror movie, like rows and rows of the same exact replica of these buildings. These buildings were also barricaded by high concrete walls. And on top of that, even if you tried to escape, there would be guards standing within each other barricading the whole area. As you could see, this was a secluded area. I mean, again, this reminded me of the Squid Games, how that specific location was just hidden in the woods. Like that, these areas were hidden deep. And you would literally have to go hunting or know the forest area in order to catch this place. The crazy thing is this area was like a little town. They had factories, a church, schooling, a barber place, and even like a bathing area. And of course, later we will find out this isn't the only location. There were a couple of different locations throughout South Korea. When there would be commands, these people would all of a sudden like salute, sing certain anthems. And of course, these new people who arrived, they weren't instructed to do anything. If they didn't follow or didn't know what to do, they would automatically get a beating. They didn't care if there was anything off rhythm or you decided to resist there would be severe punishments. One man says that they were also given only 30 toothbrushes for 120 people to all share. They also received this one clothing to wear throughout the whole year. Now these people's daily task was to do pretty much forced labor throughout the whole day. There was many facilities and factories and you see these photos, like these kids were the barber man. And one of the factories that Chung worked at was the fishing rod factory. He and many others were forced to work for long hours. And you're having kids like work in these complicated jobs and working with sharp needles and objects. I mean, he just went into detail about the horrific things that has happened, which I probably won't go into detail, um, but it's very similar to what you guys have heard about what happened in World War II concentration camps. Chung remembers at the end of the day, if you do not meet the production quantity that they assigned to you, everybody would again get severe punishment. He remembers his whole body just being bloody and scabs became old ones and they were cut again and again due to the punishments. And this happened on a daily basis. It was total total hell for everyone. They were also given very little food and everyone was slim, super skinny. I mean, nobody had nutrition in their body. People even remember some had to eat whatever they can find, including rats that they found. Now there was also even a female section and even worse, um, there were a lot a lot of s assaults when females would get pregnant they remember these doctors coming in and injecting them with unknown substances and witnesses say that all of a sudden like throughout a couple days the female that was pregnant 
would no longer have their baby. And S assaults did not just happen to females, it also happened to males as well. And there's these drawings of what the victims remember and what they had to go through. And these details of what the victims had to endure is so graphic that, you know, they themselves also, most of them don't talk about it because it is horrific. So what was this place? What is this random hell place? Why were all these people being gathered? Was it really like for fun and games? And why did no one know about it or try to save these people? So it turns out this place was called Hyeongje Bokjiwon or Brothers Welfare Center. It was supposed to be known to gather homeless people, people who didn't have a place to go, like didn't have families, aka people who were deemed unfit for society. It was the government's program giving these people a second chance, sweeping them off the streets, including like disabled people and, and putting them into this welfare center where they are supposed to have jobs, they have an education, they go to church, you know, they get food. It was advertised on TV as this amazing place that the government gave as a second chance for those who had no homes. But 70% of these people that were put into these camps weren't people who were just homeless, they were like random people that the police or whoever would just force them in. This is Mr. Choi, he was taken at the age of 14 and he remembers the guards S.A. them in front of everybody. Like these guards did not care. This happened in front of everybody during the time when they were supposed to go to sleep. He says that it was like a wild animal safari there. There was absolutely no humane part of this at all. And people did try to flee. There were many people who tried to flee, but they claimed that actually nobody, almost nobody was able to flee because the guards would catch them and soon they would find out their friend who tried to flee yesterday never came back. And that's because the punishment was often death. I think the saddest part about hearing the victims, Mr. Chung says that when, you know, all these things were happening to him, especially S.A., he says that, you know, as an adult now, in a way feels shame. He feels shameful that he went through this when it wasn't at all his fault. Now, how about the disabled people who were taken there? What happened to them? And the witnesses claimed that there was a zone where disabled people were put into, and they claimed that this was literally a zombie zone. They called it the zombie zone literally because the disabled people were actually kept all drugged up they were all in like a zombie like state and they can't fend for themselves at all two years like this passed and Chung now became 14 years old surprisingly one day he noticed from far away a very familiar face which was his own father so parents of kids like Chung who all of a sudden went missing would be devastated and, and when Chung's father found out that his kid was gone for years, he leaned on alcohol. He could not go on with his life knowing that his son vanished and the police couldn't do anything about it. So Chung's father says that multiple times he went inside the police station, begged for his son to be found. But guess what? The police looking at Mr. Chung's father and him being drunk and like screaming and yelling, he was also now considered unfit for the society and was forced into this camp. And this is Mr. Chung at 50 years old now talking about this incident for the first time. He admits that rather than feeling excited or welcome to meet his father there, he felt ashamed, embarrassed, and especially looking at his father who have aged so quickly, so much, within such a short time frame because of exhaustion, his youthful father was like no longer there. When nobody was looking, Chung's father found his son and he actually handed him over this old rice cake that he's been saving. This rice cake was given during like a Korean holiday and only one was given to each person. So his own father being hungry himself was saving this for his own son. I mean, it even just shows you how through this traumatic experience and everybody having to suppress their human emotion that for a lot of these people that humane part just never was able to be stripped away. I think one of the also sickest part about this was that this welfare center was promoted as like a god-giving place. The owner, the boss of this place, and a lot of these people were portrayed as praying, you know, believing in the word of the Bible. And yes, they were forced to sing these anthems and church choir songs. And these victims say that they were being pre about how this was what God 
has commanded. So they were literally being brainwashed in every single way that they can and just to use religion, you know, and God's name and Bible to do these horrific things is, is one of the sickest parts that people just cannot get over. It was December 1986 when Mr. Kim, who was working as a prosecutor, was on his day off and decided to go hunting. He was walking around the forest with his co-workers looking to hunt for things when all of a sudden he noticed a couple people like from afar and he noticed that the interactions with these people were super odd. Besides these labor workers, he noticed guards with long sticks and rods just hitting and abusing people. There were also these large dogs that was not leashed and intentionally scare all these labor workers. A short while later, he noticed the labor workers were put into what looked like a big animal barn and the guards would lock the heavy gates from the outside. He also noticed that some of the labor workers feet were tied in chains so that they would not flee. Mr. Kim got a really bad feeling and decided to investigate this area. Throughout the investigation in this specific area, I told you there was many different areas, but this area had about 900 kids or minors working in hard labor with 3,000 more people who was living in horrific conditions. Eventually, Kim found the office where the head leader would be staying at and he found this little like, and he found this big money box or container where he found over $20 million in cash. The welfare center leader was this man named Mr. Park. Now, when Mr. Park was interviewed by Mr. Kim, Park acted super arrogant and he would not tell anything to the police. He claimed that I can't be investigated. And that's because he was annoyed to this welfare program by one of the highest people in the government. And when I mean highest people, I mean the president of South Korea at the time anointed him to this position. So yeah, kind of, he seems a little untouchable. And when Mr. Park was anointed to this position, the government would give him a lot of money to run this program. Each person that he brought in equaled a guaranteed payment. And also all the labor work that they're doing to create, you know, the fishing rods, whatever kind of factories that all these people worked at, the revenue would also be kept all to himself. I mean, Mr. Park, his words and whatever he instructed was the law here. It got worse from here. Here. The government found out that in 1981 that the next Olympic would be held in South Korea and decided to start the process of cleaning up South Korea or beautifying South Korea so that the country can look pleasing to the eye for all the foreigners that will come to Korea because of the Olympics. Basically, human trash removal. So who would catch these people? It was the police. Each person that the police brought, they would get a certain incentive and points, and certain amount of points meant that you're gonna get a certain amount of promotion. And actually on TV, he came out and said that he is not a criminal, that he's being wrongfully convicted, and actually a lot of people kind of agreed with him because they were like, whoa, look at the streets, it's actually clean. There's actually no homeless people or orphans like standing in the streets, like it actually actually is cleaning up South Korea. Mr. Kim, being the proper investigator that he was, he was so shocked when he received calls from his higher officials. He received numerous calls telling him to reduce Mr. Park's sentences. It was his higher officials, his boss, telling him to do this. So he had no choice, but he just couldn't believe it because, I mean, he lost faith in the justice system because he saw that those who had money and power, especially annoyed by the president, that how can people get away with such horrific crimes. Now back in the 70s to 80s, the president of Korea was Chun Tu Hwan. President Chun is very controversial. Um, he is accused of doing many horrific crimes himself to the citizens. There was a huge riot in South Korea. He was known to have a military dictatorship. If you watch the drama Reply 1988 and you see Sister Pora going to do, you know, undong they call it, there was a huge protest because people were protesting against this dictatorship dictator leadership. President Chun is accused of doing horrific things, especially to those who went out to protest. So these are young people who went through tortures if you were ever caught 
protesting. Until his death, he was not apologetic. So I'm not gonna get into too much into this, but he was a very controversial president. Eventually, Mr. Park was sentenced and a lot, actually most of the charges were dropped. I believe he was sentenced for negligence. He only spent about two years and six months in prison for the horrific crimes against these people. In 1987, when this whole news came out, the camps were shut down. But because this was a program ran by the government, what happened was they just changed the name and location and started all over again. Mr. Chung, when he found out he was going to be transferred to another location, he got a call saying that his father died in this camp. No one knows why he passed away, but obviously it's presumed that he died of exhaustion and terror terrible abuse. This concentration camp lasted about 12 years and in total 38,437 people were victims of this. After these concentration camps pretty much shut down around 1988, again like I said they did change and keep the program just in different names and locations. It is said that this amount of brutality did stop but there are stories out there that even after this they had to endure you know unfair treatments. The reason why these these people were not able to come forward until pretty recently is because of the stigma. They felt as if they would still be treated as the unfit people and be labeled as that forever. And this is true because a lot of these victims who came out after the program shut down in the late 80s, they say that they didn't just return home. A lot of these people who were taken as so young, they couldn't find their parents anymore. They had to stay in other facilities, facilities for homeless or the orphanages, and a lot of them had to be put to mental facilities because throughout all those abuse, druggings, and going through all these trauma made a lot of these kids not developed as, as a fully healthy functioning adult. Another man who went to the camp with his older sister, fortunately he's okay, but his sister became a disabled person after all the traumatic abuse. It was only in 2012, 25 years after the incident, when one by one those who survived this camp stood up in front of the court house finally gathering up the courage to protest and get justice. At first Mr. Han was the first one to speak up about this and he was literally like one man protester in front of the courthouse. Quote, he said, I am 37 years old now, but the story I'm speaking is from my nine year old child self. The most important thing we're looking for is to find normal again. Unfortunately, the court or the police, whoever said that the statute of limitation was long over, that they could not do anything about it. On top of that, Mr. Park, the one who was supposed to be in charge, passed away in 2016. This is a picture of Mr. Park before he passed away and there are many documentary crews who were trying to get an interview or an answer out of Mr. Park but, but unfortunately he was very weak like apparently he has dementia, he cannot remember things and he's just like an old weak grandpa now that they were not able to get any interview with him. It was said that until Mr. Park passed away, he lived as a very wealthy man. With the money that he made from the program, he bought like other buildings and you know, I mean, this family is pretty rich. In order to protest, the victims camped out outside of the court for over 900 days. So for about three years, they have been camping outside to get someone to listen. Only in 2020, the court did grant a reinvestigation into the brothers' welfare case that happened in the 70s and 80s. And again, till this day, the victims never got any compensation or support from the government. And they believe they should because the program they were put into unfairly was by the government. And to think that those horrific people who have done this to other people are still out there living totally fine without any consequences is one of the reasons why these victims just feel so much anger now that they're an adult, now that they can protect themselves because they could not protect themselves when they were just kids. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like this video and share this story so it never gets lost. Remember to check out today's partner, Harry's. It really helps and supports my channel. See you guys in my next video.